Hey everyone, it's Marvin. Thanks so much for listening to Books and Boba. Uh, I just wanted to take a quick second to remind you that Books and Boba just launched our Patreon uh, to help support our future endeavors. Rira and I have been running Books and Boba for the last six and a half years, and we've always talked about wanting to do more, um, including expanding our content offerings, um, being able to go to book events, and do more coverage. And so um, to help us get closer to those ambitions, um, we started a Patreon to help us grow and to better support books by Asian and Asian American authors. We are offering two tiers for our Patreon. Um, the first is our regular Boba member coming in at $3 a month, which will give you access to our brand new Books and Boba Discord server so you can engage with your fellow Books and Boba Club members and also Rira and myself in real time. Uh, this is where we'll be aiming to move the bulk of our book club discussions. Uh, but rest assured, we'll still have a presence on Goodreads as well. And our premium tier is our Honey Boba member tier coming in at $5 dollars a month where in addition to access to our discord server you'll also get access to our monthly boba chats a bonus podcast where rira and i and some guests will get together each month and have a a more casual discussion on stuff that may or may not be book related as well as answer some listener q a honey boba members will also have access to a poll to help decide an official books and boba book pick uh, once per quarter so if any of that sounds interesting to you, um, support Books and Boba on Patreon by going to patreon.com slash books and boba. As always, we and I really appreciate your support. All right. Thanks for listening. And I'm on with the show. You're listening to Whoa. Hot Luck. Hot Luck. And hey, you're listening to Books and Boba, a book club and podcast featuring books by Asian and Asian American authors. My name is Marvin Yue. And I'm Rira Yu. And we are here today to discuss our July 2022 book club pick, Before the Coffee Gets Cold by Toshikazu Kawaguchi. The version that we read was translated by Jeffrey Truslot. But before we get to our discussion, I um, just wanted to do a quick check in. Um, how are you doing, Rira? It's I'm August. doing good. Yeah, it is August. Uh, we are almost done with summer, but as you know, we always say, summer doesn't end until like November in <laughs> Southern California. Uh, I went to a concert a week ago, and that was really fun. I know that uh, there were a couple of author friends that went as well, but I was unable to meet them. Um, but we like looked at each other's Instagram stories and we're like, oh, you were here. Your seats were pretty good. <laughs> and uh, one day we'll be able to meet up at a concert uh, one day. But it was really fun. Um, this was a K-pop thing or? Yeah, yeah. We went to a Tomorrow by Together concert. Mm. And then um, this past weekend, I was watching Lollapalooza because Tomorrow by Together was performing and J-Hope from BTS was headlining and then, you know, there were some other musicians that I really like, like J. Cole. So uh, it was a very musically filled, uh, like, last two weeks. That's How about awesome. you, Marvin? I have been, um, well, so I guess I can tell you and the people on this podcast, but I got engaged a month ago. Um, oh my god congratulations <laughs> also wow a month ago <laughs> yeah we didn't post on social media because um we we've been waiting to like talk to people in person and let them know because uh, uh, there are certain people that follow me on instagram that know my fiance and she, you know didn't want to steal the thunder uh, i see i see so this past weekend was spent looking at wedding bands um which oh, also means we were uh, outside shopping. And man, this not to go into weather talk, but it's been a pretty muggy summer here in L.A. And muggy summers means the, those damn mosquitoes are out in force. And we went to a sandwich place in Pasadena and we were sitting on the patio and we saw two mosquitoes fly near us. And we were like, nope, we're going to eat in the car. <laughs> I haven't eaten outside in so long. Like, I just pick up my food and go to my car yeah. or go home. Yeah. 
probably a good call these days because I did get nailed twice in my kneecaps while I was out because I was wearing shorts. Uh, it's not a good time uh, out there. <laughs> speaking of kneecaps, this is a weird uh, tangent, but uh, a couple of days ago, I like tripped on the sidewalk. It was like one of those uneven sidewalks oh, no. because of the uh, tree root. And I had coffee like in my hand, but like I as I like fell forward, um, the coffee went like flying onto the ground. And then in order to protect myself from like my teeth being hit onto the concrete, I put my hands down. Um, so like my knees were injured, my hands were injured. And I also have like a ginormous bruise under oh, my, no. underneath my chin. Are you okay? it, I was just, yeah, I'm okay. I was like, the first thing I did was like touch my teeth because I was just like, oh my God, no, that's like the most expensive part of my body that I can't. Because <laughs> like I've um, I've fallen on like concrete before and had my teeth like uh, chipped. So I'm like, this is not going to oh. happen again. No, not after like braces and all that crap. So yeah, I- I'm okay. It, but yeah, I've, I've been just telling my friends, oh, I you know, I look like I got uppercutted in my face because of this ginormous bruise. Thankfully, I wear a mask so people don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad it wasn't worse than it is. Like, I know sometimes, like, people just fall weird and things get hurt. Like, I've hurt my wrists from falling, too. I'm also a very clumsy person. And, you know, sometimes when I walk, I kind of drag my feet. So things like an uneven sidewalk will take me out if it gets a chance. I'm usually pretty good at catching myself when, <laughs> w- like, w- as I'm falling because I have pretty good balance. But there have been moments where I've, like, I've fallen downstairs twice in my life. And I'm not talking about just, like, like one flight of stairs. I'm talking, like, two, three flights of oh, stairs no. made of either, like, brick or, um, like, very hard material <laughs> and landing with quite quite a impressionable amount of force <laughs> and i was totally fine like i i seem to have very strong bones so that's good i've never broken a bone in my life uh, i've never had any like serious sprains or whatnot just a lot of bruising in my life so yeah very blessed knock on wood anyway up that <laughs> let's not regret anything um yeah in the, in the future <laughs> um much like the characters in the book that we're reading. So, uh, yeah, let's get to it. Again, we are discussing Before the Coffee Gets Cold by Toshikazu Kawaguchi. We will be touching on all plot points. So if you do not want to get spoiled on this book, um, push pause now, go read it, and then come back and listen to our discussion. Um, it's a pretty quick read, uh, pretty breezy too. So you should be able to be back soon. Unless you get caught up and decide to read all three books, I was very tempted to, to read on. After finishing this book, but uh, yeah, my advice is to go into this book as cold as possible. Don't read the reviews. Don't read um, anything that <laughs> reviewers are saying. Don't watch the movie because the movie is very different from what I hear. <laughs> so uh, yeah, pause and then come back. I couldn't find the movie. It's not streaming anywhere. I was very sad because I wanted to check it out. It's on Netflix Japan. Oh, but not Netflix America. No. Uh, but I did see that they also commissioned a TV series. So I'm sure oh, eventually that'll appear on Netflix at some point. Um, but yeah. Um, so I guess to get started, Rira, can you read us in to uh, Before the Coffee Gets Cold? In a small alley in Tokyo, there's a cafe which has been serving carefully brewed coffee for more than 100 years. But this coffee shop offers its customers a unique experience the chance to travel back in time. In Before the Coffee Gets Cold, we meet four visitors, each of whom is hoping to make use of the cafe's time-traveling offer in order to confront the man who left them, receive a letter from their husband, whose memory has been taken on by early-onset Alzheimer's, to see their sister one last time, and to meet the daughter they never got the chance to know. But the journey into the past does not come without risks. Customers must sit in a particular seat. They cannot leave the cafe. And finally, they must return to the present before the coffee gets cold. So Toshikazu Kawaguchi is a playwright. And this was actually a stage play before it was adapted into a novel. 
And maybe a quarter of the way into the first story, I was like, oh, this would be a good play. <laughs> yeah. And my instincts were correct. <laughs> Yeah, totally. There's this genre of Japanese stories that center on things like restaurants and food, uh, such as shows like Tokyo Midnight Diner or anime like um, Restaurant from Another World or Polar Bear Cafe, uh, where it follows, you know, a restaurant and it's often quirky workers as they serve a rotating cast of customers who bring their own personal stories um, to the cafe or restaurant. So, like, I was actually really excited to, like, oh, it's one of these. Let's start reading it. Um, but I also should have known because it involves time travel and regret that it's going to be a lot of, like, emotionally manipulative stories about things that we can't change, right? Emotionally manipulative. <laughs> I don't know if that's the right description for it but i do know what you mean there's like there's some tropes where it could come off as like very cheap melodrama you know it's like we've seen this repeatedly in literature and film and some of them have done it not so great so i can see why it could seem emotionally manipulative um but i listened to this book on hoopla and um the audiobook narrator arena lee um, she did a wonderful job, and I highly recommend folks to listen to the audiobook because this book was so much like a stage play. It it was kind of like a radio drama when I was listening to the book. So. Yeah. I mean, what I mean by emotionally manipulative is I knew we were in for like sad times, Tears. you know, <laughs> yeah. but at the same time, yeah, I mean, the stories are pretty hopeful in nature so maybe not manipulative per se but definitely like they're trying to tug at my heartstrings and they definitely succeeded yeah and not to say that there weren't flaws in this book but i would say like overall i enjoyed it it was pretty cozy uh whimsical indeed and uh bittersweet yeah so as we've alluded to this is a kind of a cozy slice of life cafe story about time travel and what I really loved about the time travel here is they don't spend time trying to explain the theory or what's like the science behind time travel. It just works and you have to follow these rules. And why? Because those are the rules. And I kind of like that that first short story was pretty much the setup for it. Like here are all the rules. Here is someone who is very skeptical but has to follow them. Yeah, speaking of the rules, uh, let us just go through them. So the rules of the cafe, uh, nothing that happens in the past can change in the present. Uh, second rule is you can only time travel in one specific seat. You cannot move at any time. And that seat is occupied by a ghost. And you have to wait until that ghost goes to the toilet. And she only goes to the toilet once a day. So you never know when the seat will be vacated which I thought was pretty hilarious. The third rule is you can only interact with people who have visited the cafe. So if you were trying to meet someone um, in the past and they had never visited the cafe, there's no way to meet them. So in the past, they must have visited the cafe. And the fourth and final rule is you must drink the coffee before it becomes cold to return to the present. Now this, I knew because of the title. <laughs> However... I was really surprised that there were consequences yeah. to not drinking the coffee in time. I thought it was just like, oh, your time is up. And then like you shimmer back into the <laughs> present. But it was like, oh, no, you need to drink the coffee. You had to pound that coffee cold. or else you become the time ghost. Yeah. <laughs> Which I thought was a very fun twist. Yeah. I, I, I did not expect a time ghost. Just some trivia with this book. So, like I said, this book was originally a stage play. And uh, the reason why there were so many female characters and how all, all of them happened to be the ones who travel back in time was because the amateur theatrical company that the stage play was written for, there were only three male actors and there were nine female actors. <laughs> so, naturally there had to be more roles for the women actors in this troupe. So that is the reason why um, mainly there are more women characters than men. And I heard that the sequel, uh, Tales from the Cafe, all of the time travelers are men. 
So there is some compensation for the lack of uh, male time travelers. And for the rule, nothing that happens in the past can change in the present. Um, It was actually inspired by a real person that Kawaguchi knew. Uh, His name was Mr. Suda, who was... um, who got into a very severe car accident and became disabled and lost both of his legs. Um, And Mr. Suda was such a positive and fun person who was loved by the people around him. And um, his wife, when they decide to get married, her parents opposed the marriage because they were worried about his disability And she said to her parents, I'm happy to marry a guy who has a strong, healthy mind. There are so many people who are able-bodied but have a weakness of mind. I believe I can have a happy life with this man with a healthy mind. So uh, Kawaguchi said, I didn't intend to write about regret but wanted to write about how we accept it and go forward. Mr. Suda and how he lives his life was exactly what I wanted to portray. So uh, this is an excerpt from his interview with Hoopla. And I was like, oh. I can see that. That's very interesting. <laughs> yeah, that definitely is the, the tone that he's going for. So how did you want to go about discussing this, this book? Shall we go by the order of chapters? Um, yeah, we can. I mean, I guess we can start with um, the cafe itself, right? Like, do you have any thoughts about the, the setting of the story because the entire book takes place within this cafe. Uh, were you able to picture it based on descriptions? Like- oh, there was so much description <laughs> about the cafe. And also there was a lot of description about the character's clothes. And that's why I was like, oh, this would be a good play <laughs> because the exposition is kind of written like stage directions, uh, which could be seen as a flaw uh, but I really like the fact that it was it took place in just one setting. Um, I like the fact that this cafe uh, was like created during like the Meiji era, I'm guessing. And uh, the interior is pretty much the same. Like they lovingly took care of it. And I just love cafes in general um, because I've just... Uh, like I as a writer I've you know I rely on my caffeine addiction (laughs) so I frequented a lot of cafes but when I was in Tokyo I noticed that there were a lot of like small bars and cafes and um, I have a really funny story so tangent when I was in Tokyo with my partner Uh, We were really hungry. And I told him, okay, well, I didn't plan to eat around this time. So I don't have like any restaurants in my itinerary because I am a I am a type A planner. So I was like, (laughs) you need to find a place. So he looked stuff up on his phone and we found a cafe and it was a basement cafe. So we didn't really know what they served or what whatnot and we couldn't really read the sign so we went downstairs and it turned out to be a maid cafe oh yeah um and it was just like super awkward because (laughs) we were actually there for food and the patrons there were just like there for other reasons yeah they had their reasons it was it was very funny but the, the maid that was serving us uh, she she tried very hard to practice her English on us. So, uh, but basement cafe. Uh, I I just like how it's it's a portal to another time, another world, and it really was very whimsical. And I thought it's it, it set the tone very well. How about you, Marvin? Yeah, I definitely in my head uh, pictured a very like Studio Ghibli esque cafe with lots of wood and potted plants, like very rustic and charming i definitely had a strong sense of place from just all the descriptions of the cafe and also the people that work there there are three three employees the owner nagare his wife Kay, and his cousin kazu who also serves the coffee uh what did you think about the staff of cafe funiculi funicula yeah that is the cafe name <laughs> funiculi funicula um i i really like the cast of characters um it was very obvious from the get-go that uh, this is going to be an interconnected kind of short story 
situation. And I love the fact that as you continue to read, you got a little bit more uh, about the staff and about the other characters who frequented the cafe. And it was just like so nice to see like a revolving round of lead characters you know it's like the side character becomes a protagonist in the next story it's kind of like you go to a cafe and you know like the story is about you and then it switches to the barista (laughs) and you know it's just like everybody is the lead character in their own lives yeah kind of like a, a workplace drama right like you just get to know the people that frequent there i did kind of love that there was some just obvious foreshadowing that the author did and i don't know if this is like considered a flaw or not now, some people might think it's a little cheesy or a little too obvious i kind of liked it but you know you had uh in chapter two the arrival of hirai's sister uh, who becomes the focus of chapter three and then in chapter three at the beginning you have the arrival of the girl from the future who wants to take a picture with Kay, who becomes the um, the focus of chapter four. And I don't know about you, but it was obvious that that was their daughter, right? It was pretty obvious, <laughs> but um, I don't think being predictable is a flaw in itself when it comes to storytelling, because it means that you've set up the clues <laughs> and um, it you're doing your job of building the narrative. Um, and, you know, like... Being predictable, it's it's fine as long as you still um, have that emotion, you know. Like um, like when you watch movies, like in rom coms, for example, you already know that the couple is going to get together at the end, and you already know that there's going to be a huge conflict in the middle where they almost break up or they break up, whatever. And but like at the same time, you still feel that tension. And you're just like, oh, my God, what's going to happen next? You still feel all of that, even though you already know what's going to (laughs) happen. So I don't think predictability is a flaw. And I kind of liked how even though you knew what was going to happen, it just kind of like had a slow slowness to it, like an easy pace to it. Being like, take your time. You know what's going to happen. But, you know, just enjoy the moment as it is right now. Yeah, I mean, the book is structured in a very episodic way. You know, um, every chapter starts with kind of a cold open leading up to a customer's arrival and then exploring their specific story of that day uh, leading up to their travel back in time and their catharsis. So so it's definitely a very structured story. Um, and I kind of like that it followed a formula. It, it was like watching a like a limited TV series, you know? Um, so let's dig into the stories so the first story is the lovers um so in my opinion this was probably the mildest of all four stories uh, because it has a disadvantage of explaining all of the rules yeah half of this chapter is just explaining how this world works and the actual like the actual time travel part was like maybe like the last i don't know fifth of the story (laughs) Uh, what did you think about Fumiko? I thought that Fumiko was a great, um, I guess, starter customer for the series. Um, you know, her as a character is someone who is um, very smart, but also very analytical and very cynical and skeptical. So, um, you know, her story is that um, her big regret is not telling her partner uh, not to leave when he gets accepted into, I think, a fellowship in America uh, because she was too proud or something. And, you know, that's her big regret. And she wants to go back and try to um, change things. And so uh, I thought it was really funny to pair her with Kazu, who is, you know, the worker who pours the coffee and explains the rules. Because Kazu is also someone who is very, like, she doesn't she doesn't understand emotions well. She's very um, cold and analytical. And so, you know, she's explaining all these rules to Fumiko. While Fumiko is in a very emotionally desperate um, frame of mind. And um, all of these rules just keep stressing her out. And I thought it was really funny, the interaction between those two. Yeah, every time a new rule was introduced, like Fumiko being like, oh, there's another rule? Oh my god, like, it's so annoying. What's the point of traveling back in time with all of these rules? And um, and just like the frustration with her being like, when is the ghost going to move? <laughs> like, I really need to travel back in time. And um, 
Like, there was definitely a lot of, like, comedic relief and her frustration with the rules. Obviously, she is a proxy uh, for the audience because, you know, we're learning the rules with her and we're also experiencing the same whiplash of, <clears throat> there's another rule? Like, <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> yeah, and I thought it was really cool that, you know, you have this amazing phenomenon of going back in time, but you can't really do anything with it. Right. This is not a story about going back and changing the past. Like, because, like we said, one of the rules is you can't change the past. And therefore, you cannot change the present. Yeah. Like, whatever you do in the past can't change the present. And later on in the book, they explain that um, the world will just rewrite causality to make sure that the present doesn't change. And so, no matter what you do, even if you try to tell someone not to do something, they'll eventually do something else that has the same effect. And I like that the author put up these rules right up front. So like we're not going to have to deal with like butterfly effect or things like that. It's more. Yeah, just, that would just make things so much complicated. We it, wouldn't be able to get that slow slice of life story <laughs> yeah. vibe. Yeah, this book was very much like vibes. <laughs> yeah, definitely lots of vibes, uh, lots of self-discovery. You know, the the customers who go back in time in the story, um, they're not going back to solve a problem or to change the future. They're all going back to reclaim something that they either missed or they want to learn more about. Um, and it's more about them finding closure and direction more than... Um, More than anything. Yeah, they all come back with a sense of purpose, I would say. Yeah. There is some catharsis after uh, after their trip. Um, In terms of Fumiko's relationship with Goro, her boyfriend who goes to America, um, Fumiko is described, to my annoyance, as someone who is as beautiful as a fashion model, knows six languages, is very career-driven, and uh, she repeatedly says that so many men have tried to pick her up, but she's chosen Goro, this guy who is a software engineer at her company, and he's very quiet, very geeky in terms of, you know, stereotypical portrayals of nerdy geeks. And people are always wondering, why are you why are you with him? And I seem to ask the very same question of why are you with this mediocre man? (laughs) Also, there seems to be absolutely no love between you guys. Like she is so desperate for him to stay with her. But I'm like, I have zero stake in this relationship. Like, why are you chasing after this guy who really has zero communication skills. <laughs> yeah, I think part of it might be the fact that um, the story was so condensed because that chapter, a lot of it was exposition on how time travel works. And so you couldn't dive deep into the chemistry. Uh, but at the same time, I guess I just kind of accepted that her relationship with Goro was strong enough to warn her wanting to go back in time and make things right. But thinking back on it, I guess you can definitely see that home, like. A dude definitely wrote these characters. Yeah, I we're going to go into my criticisms about the female characters and and how uh, Kawaguchi wrote them. But um, our commenter, Renko Tsuban, thank you for all of your detailed comments. Uh, they watched the Japanese film and they said that Fumiko and Goro's relationship was very much changed in the movie so that they actually have a relationship. (laughs) Um, Yeah, they're like childhood friends who kind of, you know, there was always something there, but they never had the courage to make it into something more. And I was like, that's a really smart decision because there is like more of an emotional stake in why she wants him to stay. And it kind of makes him more of a likable character rather than someone who is just, I don't know, he he has no communication skills. It's just like, how how is this relationship working? <laughs> yeah, it's been a while since I read that first one, but I think the setup was just so tropey that I just accepted it. I think that's what happened. I mean, for a lot of people, they might think Fumiko is very vapid because she is so desperately clinging on to this mediocre man. But I think the whole point was that Fumiko, 
she is like a stand in for the audience. And, you know, as like so many people have gone through breakups and have wanted to go back in time or replay that moment of like, oh, if I only said this or if I only did yeah. this. So I can see why she was written in this way, kind of make her as like general and relatable as possible in terms of her situation. But I really wish <laughs> there was more specific details to their relationship that made me care about them more. Yeah, or if the author was like a little bit more, I guess, kinder to Goro <laughs> in describing like what makes them attractive, right? Yeah, and I know like another common complaint is like Fumiko is super career driven and, you know, she's only like in her 20s. So why is she so adamant about <laughs> about like settling down or you know, people harassing her about, you know, getting married and all that. And I think this is just life. People always have to comment on a woman's, like, reproductive status or, you know, their marital status. And it's like, yeah, that's just, especially in Japan, too. Like, that's the whole thing with, like, the birth rate and the pressure to, like, have a family and also blaming it a lot on the women in Japanese society saying, why aren't you getting married? Mm. But it's also like, look at the men around them. (laughs) Do they want to (laughs) be? Yeah. Do they want to be shackled to these men who don't really treat them right and have zero communication skills? Yeah, it definitely feels like there's a lot that can be mined from there. If the author was interested in telling that story, which obviously, you know, the author wasn't. He wants to tell stories about finding closure by looking back. Um, But on that note, uh, moving on to the second short story, Husband and Wife. um, What did you think about the story of um, Kotage and Fusaki? Um, I think Husband and Wife was definitely my favorite. And from reading other people's comments, uh, that seemed to be the case for a lot of people. Um, I wrote in my comment on Goodreads that is Alzheimer's overused in literature and films as a cheap narrative device? Yes, but I think as opposed, uh, in contrast to Fumiko and Goro's relationship, I had a lot of emotional stake in Kotake and Fusagi's story. Um, There was just like this gentle, tender care in describing their relationship. I thought Fusaki was not a very good husband. It was also a case of why is this woman with this man who also have zero communication skills and throws her birthday present into the bin because, you know, she properly guesses that he had something yeah. as a surprise for her. Is I mean, okay. But the- regardless, <laughs> but regardless, I really like their story. <laughs> yeah i thought the trope of emotionally unavailable asian man was like an asian american thing where do you I think guess. that comes from <laughs> marvin it comes from asia <laughs> like why do you think our parents and grandparents are emotionally unavailable it's because it comes from that side of their experience and it just gets passed down i did remember thinking that man usaki's kind of a jerk and i know he's being written as like a prickly person with like who's secretly very kind but yeah that birthday present thing was pretty messed up also him being like oh we can't sit together because we're husband and wife that's too much show of affection and i was like what <laughs> what <laughs> but uh, the feeling of fusagi being kind of a weird husband aside i really like their story um and I think they really embodied the theme that Kawaguchi was going for. And this is actually a quote from the book. No matter what difficulties people face, they will always have the strength to overcome them. It just takes heart. And I love the fact that like Kotake is going back in time uh, to get the letter that her husband never gave to her. And, and, And like the letter that he wrote I think that was like his moment of redemption in my eyes <laughs> being like, oh, he really cares about his wife. Like he knows that, you know, he knows her. He knows that because she's a nurse that she would take care of him as a nurse and not as a wife. And um, that moment when she tells him, yeah, you get better in the future. Like 
everything's going to be okay. And, you know, he pretends to believe her and she downs her coffee and she notices that his shoulders are shaking and he's crying. And you're like, oh, he already knows that she's lying, but he's giving her that moment of dignity. And I was like, wow, this is a really tender, private moment. And I thought it was written pretty well. I can only imagine how much more powerful it would be with actors because you see like all of the micro expressions on their face. Yeah. I also liked how um, the letter she went back in time to receive from her husband turned out to be like a very technical and matter of fact letter. It's sweeter when you think about the fact that he was illiterate. (laughs) Like he didn't know how to write and he would ask people to read or I guess like he knew a few characters and he was able to piece things together. (laughs) And he wrote this letter to her and it's full of heart. And you know that he like, you know, he's not a good writer. So the fact that he took the effort to write it and, you know, like him wanting to go back in time and be like able to give it to her. That's also like very sweet because he shows up every day. Yeah, I think definitely the second story was the most heartwarming. Uh, But our uh, commenter Renko Tsuban said that in the movie, the roles are reversed. So Fusagi is the caretaker and Kotake is the one who um, has Alzheimer's. And I thought that was like a very like, I was like, huh, that's very intriguing because I am so used to, (laughs) to seeing women cast as caregivers for uh, relatives with medical ailments. And that's just like a part of our culture. Like daughters and wives are really just, you know, given all of that burden. I do like that switch up. It feels like the movie understood like the parts of the book that probably didn't age as well or weren't as strong. Here's the thing. The movie was directed by a woman. Oh, that makes sense too. (laughs) Yeah, so there were a lot of changes. And I was like... Huh. Huh. Interesting. Yes. Yeah. Because definitely, you know, now that you mentioned it, maybe this is my dude brain not picking it up. But all four of the stories involve women doing a lot of the emotional heavy lifting while the dudes just act aloof. Yeah. Like there's a lot of, you know, selfless women who are sacrificing, you know, parts of their life for the good of their family. And... You know, I like the fact that the movie changed that because, you know, like Fusagi, like they're like, it's nice to see Fusagi be a a caring husband, you know, like his wife has taken care of him for a long time and now it's his turn to give back that love to her. So I think that's a very nice switch. I have not watched the movie yet, but I am very interested in watching it to see how that relationship, how that gender role reversal uh, affects their relationship and story overall. How can we watch a Netflix Japan? Do we need to find someone? Uh, VPN. Oh, this is true. VPN. You've solved it. You've done it. <laughs> we are we are not <laughs> sponsored by um, Surfshark or any of the influencer VPNs, but uh, maybe we should you know, petition for it. <laughs> <laughs> so moving on to the third story, uh, which actually gets foreshadowed in the second chapter where um, Yaiko Harai's sister comes looking for her to try to bring her back to their hometown. And we see that Hirai, who is a regular at the coffee shop, is going through extreme lengths to avoid talking to her sister, even hiding below the bar. And her younger sister leaves, leaving a letter with Kay to give to Hirai. And knowing what kind of story this is, I think we can all see where this is headed, um, especially with chapter three being the sisters. I mean, were you surprised by Hirai's sister's off-screen death um, leading up to the third story? I was like, of course she would die in a car crash. (laughs) Because I was just like, I'm waiting for a story where someone is dead and you have someone going to the past to talk to the dead person. So it has to be this story or the mother and child story. So the fact that it showed up earlier than I thought, um, I was just like, okay, I'm here for the ride. Cool. Uh, Like I said, predictability is not a flaw. Um, I 
thought Hirai had the most amount of personality among the four women. And I just love how, you know, brusque she is and how free-spirited she is. And, um, like, I don't know, like, her, her backstory with her sister and her family, I was like, oh, that's really relatable. And I think the scene where she meets her sister in the past was pretty powerful. Yeah, it really seems like there's, you know, each story kind of progresses in its emotional damage. Um, The first two is about lost love, but the last two are about death. And I like the detail that Kay gives Hirai a timer uh, when she goes back in time because she knows that because she's dealing with seeing someone who's already dead, um, the risk of them not coming back in time is way higher. Yeah, yeah, because that's how the current ghost is stuck in her predict- predicament because she uh, was visiting her dead husband. But, yeah, like, the moment where Hirai realizes that, you know, Kumi wanted to run the inn together, and it wasn't like that her sister wanted to offload the responsibility of the inn to her older sister and just, like, live her free life. I thought that was, like... I don't know. That, that was such a heart wrenching moment because you realize that they spent all these years apart for absolutely no reason. It's like you could have had so much time together and now you don't have any time left. So that's what made it like really bittersweet for me. Yeah, this is definitely the one that was like the most, you know, it's going to be sad times because I mean, again, like. The, the predictability of Kumi just wanting to spend time with Harai was, you can see that from a mile away, right? You can see that it's Harai's own, like, self-projection, self-centeredness that is, like, keeping that from happening, right? Because the whole um, exchange in Chapter 2 was her saying, oh, she must resent me for living my own life. And she obviously wants the same thing. So, obviously, she's here to drag me back to something I don't want to do. Which, like, when I read that, I was like, yeah, this definitely won't come back and bite you in the butt later. Yeah, and I think her eyes guilt is pretty relatable because, you know, she says, oh, my sister wouldn't have died if she wasn't visiting me. If she said yes to coming back home, like, maybe things would have changed. And I think that is a very relatable uh, sense of feeling for a lot of surviving members of freak accidents like these yeah especially if it's someone younger than you right like you obviously she thought she would have more time to eventually make up with her sister or just to talk to her eventually and then you know that time is taken away from you which becomes the impetus for her to want to go back in time and you know she's the first person um, since Fumiko, who like is in an emotionally desperate place, right? And as a result, she also angers the time ghost, which, which as the book explains, if you're pushy with the time ghost, the time ghost will curse you. Yeah. I, I mean, what was the curse again? You're like frozen to the floor and you like feel crushed. Yeah. It's just like immense spiritual pressure. Ah, I see. I like the fact that Kazu is the only one who's able to break the curse. Yeah, I thought it was really funny that the two servers, Kay and Kazu, are like polar opposites of each other. Kazu's very literal and doesn't understand emotions. And Kay's very empathetic and bubbly. And, you know, overall in the entire book, you kind of spend the most time with Kay and especially Kazu. Yeah, and it makes sense because Kazu's the one who, you know, has like the coffee ceremony of yeah. uh, sending people back in time. And, you know, even though she has trouble expressing emotions, she always wants to do the right thing. And, you know, to her, the right thing is always very logical and obvious. Like when she doesn't understand why Hirai doesn't just take the letter to read later. Um, And like the way that she bails out whoever the time ghost is cursing uh, because she knows the solution and she sets out to do it right away. I thought it was super funny when uh, they were like, when is that ghost going to move? And Kazu's like, maybe this will work. And she just keeps pouring the coffee (laughs) in order to get the ghost to have a full bladder and go into a toilet. And I was like, how does a ghost still have a bladder is just like so weird to me. And the ghost can't reject uh, coffee. 
So even though the the coffee cup is still full, she still has to say yes. And I was like, huh, interesting rule. Those are just the rules, you know. You don't question the rules. If you think too hard about it, where does it end, right? I mean, you have to suspend your disbelief. <laughs> it's a magical cafe. Just roll with it. Um, which I guess brings us to the last story, Mother and Daughter, which was the story set up in the third chapter in which the twist is instead of going to the past, um, someone goes to the future. Yeah. And, you know, I figured that would happen. Someone <laughs> must have asked at some point, can you go to the future? And, you know, there's a lot of problems with that because you're like, how do you know that the person that you want to meet will visit the cafe? And how do you picture seeing them if that moment has never happened? So a lot of logistics to figure out. Um, yeah. And so the fourth chapter is about Kay, um, who is the wife of Nagare, the proprietor of the cafe. Um, and in chapter three, we discover that she is expecting a child. Um, and in this chapter, we also learn that she has a heart condition um, that she inherited from her father. And this heart condition will make it difficult for her to um, survive her pregnancy, but she is very determined to have this child. Um, but she's also stressed out because she's not sure if the child will be able to grow up well without her. And so she decides she wants to time travel, but to the future, um, in hopes of seeing her child grown up. And this is a different type of uh, motivation than the other people who travel back in time because she isn't regretting something that she did in the past, but she's worried about the future and things that she has no control over. And, you know, in the end, she gets a different kind of catharsis, I think. Yeah, yeah. And also, um, Kay having a heart condition, she doesn't even know if her baby is going to survive. So, um, you know, her going to the future is, you know, just to know <laughs> if her efforts are worth it, I guess. Um, this was my least favorite out of all the stories. And it's because I personally hate stories where a pregnant woman decides to sacrifice herself to give birth, like knowingly sacrifice herself. And Kay, knowing that she has a heart condition, knowing that you know, she'll probably pass away from giving giving birth. I'm just like, why? Why? <laughs> like, what makes you want to have a biological child that badly that you would just willingly sacrifice your life like that? And maybe I would have given it, maybe I would have given the author more grace if he had actually gone into her reasons why. <laughs> and it just it does not help him in the case of all of the women kind of sacrificing themselves. Yeah, it seems like a pretty unfortunate um, common theme amongst his stories. And if you think about it, it's very conservative because, like, like what is it? Kay doesn't have a phone and... Not, like because she's like oh like my husband has a phone so I don't see like why I need a phone and I'm like what like do you not have a personal life outside of like your married life like is your identity tied to just your husband and then with Fumiko who wants to travel into the future to see if she's going to get married to her boyfriend I'm I'm just like why like why do you need that to happen like technology exists and also is is it worth <laughs> the efforts like just to see if you're gonna get married like why is marriage like the penultimate uh goal in life i i just yeah there's definitely I had so many issues with it <laughs> in three out of the four stories it definitely seems like the women um who are the main characters um, their lives center around um, the men in their lives. And that's a little bit gross considering how Japan, like I said, with the birth rate and how they're pressuring women over there to get married and have kids. And it's like, that's not like every woman's goal in life. And the fact that this author is kind of pushing that message of this is the ideal situation for women to get married and to have children. And it's like... I don't yeah, know, man. it's kind of a bummer that, you know, time travel as a framing device for addressing grief, uh, regrets, and anxiety is definitely something that's 
universal and relatable. We all have things that we regret. We all have things that we're um, anxious about from the future. And all the stories, like the emotions that are invoked are pretty relatable. But it just, it sucks that it's um, packaged along with these outdated patriarchal tropes that, I mean, are pretty glaring now that I think about it. But, it, you know, maybe it's just my dude brain again. But when I was reading it the first time, I did have the thought that, you know, the guys in the story, they all kind of suck. But uh, it didn't really click to me that it's couched in these tropes of patriarchy and conservatism until until you brought it up. Um, I also just... Like I said, this is my least favorite story, so I have a lot, a lot of criticisms <laughs> about it. But I just really hated the fact that Kay constantly said, I'm so sorry that, you know, me giving birth to you was the only thing I could do for you. And I'm like, really? You freaking sacrificed your life to give birth to your kid. I'm pretty sure that's not just quote unquote, the only thing, like as if your life is just meaningless and it's not worth anything uh, to your kid. And I don't know, like it, like we said emotionally manipulative at the beginning of this podcast. And I'm like that. I was like, I know what you're trying to do. And I just feel annoyed <laughs> because it's like, I know I'm supposed to feel, I'm just like, wow, like she finally had like a moment to spend time with like her child, even though it was just like this brief moment where uh, it's full of awkwardness and they don't quite know what to say. And uh, her daughter finally says, I'm grateful that you gave your life for me. I'm happy. I have people who love me. And it's like, wow, that's a touching moment. But also it's so tainted by this gross patriarchal notion that <laughs> uh, a pregnant woman's life is, you know, worth less than the child that she is pregnant with. It, I'm just like, wow, uh, did not need to have that. I feel like there are much better ways to go about um exploring the relationship between a mother and daughter. <laughs> I don't know. Like maybe like an alternative is like, you know, there are some moms who don't do well in patriarchal societies where they expect to be the housewife and the primary caretaker of, of their child. Um, and I feel like a lot of guilt is pushed on to career women. So that's probably something that would have been interesting. A mom who chose her career or chose herself over uh, being being a traditional mom and, you know, her child kind of having resentment for it and the mom feeling guilty about it. And, like, I feel like that would have been a better dynamic to explore. There's, like, a ton of other examples, but I'm just pulling one out of, like, yeah. My writer's hat right now. <laughs> and knowing now that uh, this was originally a play written for a theater troupe that was mainly female, um, I wonder, and this is just me intuiting, I wonder if this is just a result of someone who doesn't have the um, nuance to write female characters being forced to write a play with multiple female characters and just defaulting on, and just defaulting on like the tropes that they're used to and... You know, those tropes being outdated results in this type of portrayal. And, you know, if that's the case, then it totally makes sense that the second book, he switches it up and, you know, writes from... Men? Yeah, from the <laughs> perspective of male characters. It it would be nice to see the men do the emotional labor, you know? <laughs> For me, like, do you can you imagine my frustration reaching the final chapter and that was what I had to read? And I was like... <laughs> Should have ended it on the sisters chapter. Just, yeah, the sisters chapter at just least. Just make the <laughs> other stories longer. Do you need that final story? No. <laughs> yeah, I thought that sisters chapter was probably one of the stronger uh, stories because it has to do with like intense emotions coming from um, grief and the death of a family member. And unsurprisingly, maybe it has nothing to do with the relationship between a man and a woman. Yeah, I love stories about sibling love, you know? Uh, so I have a question for you, Marvin. Yeah. If you could go back in time for a brief moment, what would it be? Mm, I don't know, to be honest. Um, 
I, I think that's a very healthy answer. <laughs> I think I've been lucky enough not to have any major traumatic experiences that would lead to feelings of intense regret. I mean, I've done things I'm embarrassed about, but nothing to the point of needing to. And actually, we did mention that there's one last rule that we discover in chapter four, which is you can only time travel once. And keeping that in mind, um, if I only had one chance to travel back in time, there's no moment right now or person that I desperately need to see or talk to. Um, and so I don't know. We'll see. We'll see in a couple of years if um, if anything happens. Yeah, when you're like in your deathbed, you're like, oh, one more moment of when I was young. <laughs> Uh, what about you? I feel like I'm the opposite of you. I do have a lot of moments I do regret. Um, but in the back of my head, it's just like I, I live with this knowledge of like, oh, it's not it, it doesn't mean anything like replaying all of those regrets in your mind is not going to make your life any better. Thanks to a copious amount of therapy in my <laughs> life, I was able to come to that conclusion. Um but for me, I'm probably the most similar to Hirai. Um, I would probably go back uh, in time to see someone and be able to talk to them one last time and have that closure. So yeah, that would be my time travel <laughs> moment, I guess. I mean... Just tell them that I love them and, <laughs> you know... Say I'm sorry and all of that jazz. Yeah. I mean, in a way, the coffee at Cafe Funicula Funicula is like therapy. It's time travel therapy. I wonder what would have happened if these characters did have therapy. Like, <laughs> actually went to therapy. <laughs> um, yeah, then, we, then we'd have no book, right? <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. Yeah. And as we close our discussion of Before the Coffee Gets Cold... Um, I just want to say that overall, I think I had a good time reading this book. Um, Character flaws notwithstanding, um, it was exactly what it advertised itself to be, which is a story of four people who travel back in time for various reasons in this magical cafe filled with interesting people. And it was a nice light summer read to get us through uh, July. Quote unquote light summer. There are some depressing moments (laughs) in this book. However, I would say it's a very hopeful read. It's yeah, short. It's so. you know short and short and bittersweet. Yeah, short and bittersweet. But it wasn't like crushing sadness, right? Where it wasn't like existential crises. It was just like, oh, here's some heartwarming stories about loss and regret <laughs> that'll make you feel more motivated to take charge in your life. All right. On that note, that'll do it for our discussion of Before the Coffee Gets Cold by Toshikazu Kawaguchi. Thanks to everyone who. Um, sounded off in our Goodreads forums. We had a pretty good discussion for this book. Um, lots of thoughts that are pretty aligned with um, Rira's overall takes with the book. Um, if you have thoughts of your own about our discussion or the book itself, please let us know on our Goodreads forums. We always love to hear what our listeners think. And yeah, uh, Rira, now that we're in August, what are we reading this month for book club? We are reading Honey and Ishi's Guide to Fake Dating by Adiba Jargadar. And obviously from the title, you can assume that fake dating is a major plot device in this book. Uh, It follows Hani Khan, who is pretty much the popular girl in her school, as she comes out as bisexual to her friends. And they invalidate her identity, saying that she can't be bi if she's only dated guys. And in my opinion, I say, dump your friends. They're bad. (laughs) Like, you don't need them in your life. Uh, so panicked, Hani blurts out that she's in a relationship with Ishu Day, a girl her friends absolutely detest and is the complete opposite of popular Hani. She is, Ishu is a very, um, very much an overachiever uh, and wants to be head girl. So Ishu agrees to help Hani with her fake dating. In return, she wants to be more popular. So she's pretty much using Hani as like oh. her campaign manager. <laughs> um, but Adiba is a Bangladeshi Irish author. So it is our first time reading a book by an Irish author. And I'm like, cool. I should have known when you said head girl. I was about to say like, <laughs> oh, yeah. Like, do we have houses? <laughs> like, <laughs> 
This sounds fun. Um, definitely no bittersweetness here, right? There were no tears or emotional manipulation to be found in I know. the story. We'll see. But it does sound we'll like see. a lot of fun. We'll it sounds like they're wearing his trope on its sleeve, which means it's probably going to go deeper than that, which I'm excited to explore as well. But yeah, looking forward to checking that out with you at the end of August. Um, just a quick reminder that you can find all the books that we discuss on our podcast, in addition to other um, really great curated um, book lists by Rira, on our Books and Boba online bookshop. Uh, you can check it out by going to booksandboba.com and clicking on the bookshop link. All sales will help support your local bookstores as well as our podcast. So um, we really do appreciate everyone who has made a purchase through uh, through the store. All right. Well, thanks for listening to another episode of Books and Boba. Uh, we'll see you all next time. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thanks for listening to Books and Boba. This podcast was hosted by Marvin Yue and Ri Rayu and edited and produced by Marvin Yue. Follow the book club on Twitter and Instagram by going to at Books and Boba and engage with us on Goodreads on our Goodreads group. You can also check out past episodes of the podcast by going to booksandboba.com and by subscribing to us on your favorite podcast app. Don't forget, you can support Books and Boba and Asian American authors by purchasing books at our bookshop.org account. Check out the link in our show notes and also at booksandboba.com. Books and Boba is a proud member of the Potluck Podcast Collective, a collective of Asian American hosted podcasts featuring unique voices and stories from the Asian diaspora. Learn more about the collective and check out our fellow Potluck shows by visiting the website podcastpotluck.com. Thanks for listening. Sharon. Hey, Remen. How are folks still racist? I know, right? We're like two decades into the 21st century. Yeah. And second question, where's my jetpack? Well, I can't help you there, but have I got a podcast for you. Modern Minorities is a show where each week, my longtime pal Remen and I uncover common and uncommon truths that we all need to hear for our majority brains and ears. Yeah. Sharon and I have spoken to doctors, lawyers, directors, climate activists, angry Asians, athletes, chefs, writers. Folks who are black, brown, gay, straight, and everything in between. Past guests have included comedian Margaret Cho, Southern Poverty Law Center journalist Geraldine Mariba, comics creator Jean Lun Yang, and many, many more. We've even talked about Ramadan, Black History Month, Kamala Khan, and Robin being queer. It's like we're trying to solve racism with the podcast. Challenge accepted. So check out Modern Minorities at modmypod.com or wherever you get your favorite podcasts. Remember, we're all modern minorities, but we're no one's model minority. Modern Minorities.